a great privilege to be here with you, and thanks for doing this for Andrew. I know that there's a Weezer concert about to start at the Mandalay Bay, and when you get a room full of bloggers, that's always a big draw, so <laughs> thanks for being here. I was asked to do a tribute to Andrew, and it's very hard for me to do that, because the hardest thing for me to watch on the day Andrew died was not the hate that came from the left, which we always laughed at anyway, but the fact that people who had given Andrew the cold shoulder or had frozen him out of media or politics were suddenly talking about him and how great he was. And that pained me more than ever, anything because Andrew didn't care about the hate. What he cared about was the silence. And because tributes are hard for me, when it comes to Andrew, I want to try to put something to rest. You know, conservatives have been trying to pick up the pieces as we figure out what to do after Andrew's passing. And there's almost a debate that comes up on every issue. What would Andrew do? And I've used that argument. Andrew would have done this. He wouldn't have done that. Had he used against me in arguments. And we all kind of try to parse out what Andrew would have done on something. And the truth is, we often don't know. And, for example, I often have said, well, Andrew wouldn't have picked a favorite in this particular race. And then I'm reminded that, well, he backed Spencer Backus's challenger because of the insider trading scandal that Breitbart editor Peter Schweitzer exposed and that we ran with. The Kimberlin incidents and everyone blogging about it, Andrew felt different ways about that, too. And, Sometimes didn't go after people who were the biggest villains. Sometimes he wanted to give them a bigger platform, not take them out of the game. It's hard to know sometimes because Andrew didn't know what he was going to do. And, you know, I, I'm an observant Jew and I keep the Sabbath, so I don't work on Saturdays. And the most tense moment of my week wasn't Monday morning. It was Saturday evening when I had to open my email and find out whatever Andrew had just done. <laughs> and... Larry can attest to the conversations we had about that when we were trying to piece it together. And sometimes Andrew was wrong and sometimes he was right, far more often. There was the Nancy Pelosi episode where he called her something unmentionable. That didn't go over so well, even if it might have been true. And there was the episode where Larry called me frantically saying, Andrew just told a bunch of people to go to hell. And I watched the video and I called him back and I said, it was right, it was okay. <laughs> and that was in Wisconsin. But we, we often don't know what Andrew would have done because Andrew used different tactics for different situations. The one thing Andrew was consistent about was the media and its importance and why conservatives have to understand it. We're all here because we care about politics. But for Andrew, the media, was more important than politics, even though politics was critical. And culture was more important than the media because culture set the stage for media. Media was the gatekeeper to both, and so the thing that Andrew always wanted to do was to get into media so that we could transcend these walls that the left, the government, and mainstream academia have put in our way. And he would try anything to break down those walls. Sometimes he would try outrage, which has worked in the Brett Kimberlin incident that conservatives have broken through. Sometimes he would try humor, and later tonight you'll see the Occupy Unmasked movie, and Andrew and I, I think, made one of the first little videos that was ever made about Occupy one day. We were trying to figure out what to do with it, and we said, let's go make fun of it. So we went down to Occupy LA with two cameras. Always good to have two cameras. And there they were. The stereotypes on parade. You had the young socialist who learned it from a guy in jail who was in jail for robbery, which Andrew thought was brilliant. You had an SEIU thug literally following Andrew all around the demonstration. And there it was. It was just funny. And later he got into some aspects and other bloggers piled on showing evidence of things that weren't so funny. And the one argument I had with Andrew where I was most wrong was about what he did at CPAC when he walked into a crowd. And he said, stop raping people. And I said, Andrew, what are you doing? You look weird. And he said, 
you don't understand. This is content, and content drives media, and this is the only way we get their attention, is if we're sensational, if we're persistent, if our facts are there, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to get them there. So it's not always clear what Andrew would have done in any situation, and I think we need to remember that, but also remember that the strategic landscape he saw was one where we have to break through, and it's not always easy. The uh, Jewish community around the world today, and Andrew, as Larry likes to say, was never a particularly observant Jewish person, but he liked to say he batted cleanup on the Judeo-Christian softball team. <laughs> and uh, Jewish people around the world this week are going to read the portion of scripture that deals with the 12 spies. It's the first recorded case of journalism in all of human civilization. Moses takes the people to the boundary of the promised land, and they say, we want to find out what's there before we cross over. So he says, okay, give me one person from each tribe. They're going to go out, do some research, come back, and give a report. And 10 of those 12 lied, and only two told the truth. That sounds about right for today's ratio. <laughs> And the two who told the truth, one was Joshua, who was Moses' chosen successor and was a warrior and would lead people into battle. And the other was Caleb, who was an ordinary person. And the Bible doesn't tell us about Joshua's account. It tells us it was true, but it doesn't dwell on that because everybody expected jo uh, Joshua to tell the truth, and he was close to Moses. They dwelled on Caleb's account. Caleb was someone, an ordinary person, who just had to report the facts because he could do no other. And it's for all the Caleb's in this room, the people who have come forward and found a voice over the last few years, with the help of Andrew and the help of other organizations in this room, Americans for Prosperity, Right Online Conferences, all the people involved, that's who Andrew cleared a path for. Andrew was a Joshua, and my temperament's more of a Caleb. My job most of the time was to tell Andrew, no, you can't do that. So we had arguments every day, and Andrew was right most of the time. But I want to close by just talking about the fact that Andrew understood that each of us can play these roles in different ways at different times. It was the day Andrew died, and I was on CNN to talk about Andrew. And they asked me about the Shirley Sherrod case, which they had been doing all day. They couldn't simply talk about Andrew's career, they had to talk about that, and, and I gave it right back to them, and I shamed the moderator into changing the subject. And then in the green room, I was getting a drink of water, and they had someone else talking about the Sherrod case. And I called every single person I knew in CNN, and I said, you put me back on the air, I just debunked what you just said, this is a lie, and you're spreading it again, you're defaming a man on the day he died, get me on TV. I'd never fought like that before in my life. And eventually security took me out of the building. <laughs> so for all the Caleb's in the room, when you watch the films tonight and you see what people have to say about Andrew and what he did, whether it's through outrage or for humor, at some point you're going to have to stand up and fight. And remember Andrew when you do, because he planted that seed in all of us. And it's there growing and flourishing right here tonight. I'd like to introduce Alex.